So this is where we will see everything's involved. We see technology and people and and we see the situation. We are in a bit too much, and we end up creating what we call the regime of scarcity. And education is very good at making things scarce and not really scarce. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Like that. Have you ever heard of this talk? No, that's true. I haven't yet. I've managed to find these several archives of him actually talking through how he came to the And it's on the history of our And I think it adds a lot because. He can be a bit of choose a fruit, but he's is really well thought out. Uh, uh, you know how he died? No. When he died, yeah. Yeah. so he got, got cancer, he got throat cancer, and um, uh, yeah. he went to the doctor, and the doctor um, said, OK, well, we can operate. And, and Lily said, they will have to go to school. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's OK, you can charge the reception. They said, I'm paid. I don't operate, I just give me more pain and I've managed my own grief. So his other, his other information is about health and about self Yeah, yeah. Don't you know, don't think you can like help. Give me the feeling that it's good. Give me the feeling that it's good. Give me the feeling that it's good. Give me the just by managing that. Seriously. It was the other thing. Right, right. Comrades, welcome back for the, the next installation uh, of guest speakers. Um, so, as I mentioned last week, this week we have Alex. How do you pronounce his surname? Dunedin. Dunedin. It's the old name for Edinburgh, the, the city where I grew up. Alex. Oh, okay. Alex Dunedin. So, that's, that's why I chose the name. So. Ah, right, there we go. Uh, so, so this is Alex. Uh, I know I've mentioned him uh, on and off. Uh, so this week, you have the kind of uh, privileged insight of elements of his biography uh, and also the work that Alex has done and this with the Ragged University. So same format as the guest speaker, not last week, but the week before. So Alex, We've got the first part of the session, however long that takes, uh, to do the insight into stuff. And then you will fracture off into your little groups of one of your provocations. Um, so we've got the um, sticky wall stuff. You don't have to put them on the wall, they actually work perfectly fine on the table if you don't fancy standing and writing on the wall. Uh, but that's, that's the same format. And also, welcome to, to Dr. Mark Johnson from the University of Liverpool, who's sitting in to listen to our good comrade Alex as well. I think that's all I wanted to get. Yeah, Spoke around to your assessment, so I'll distribute those sheets uh, later. So, without. Ah, you, you are recording. Oh, yeah. Uh, is everybody all right with me recording this section? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, everything that I do, I like to uh, share with the community via the website because it's open education. So. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I feel now sit down and hang on to Alex. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Craig uh, and Angie, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm really glad to, to be sharing some of my thoughts and experiences on, on what informal education means. Um, it, it was a total surprise to me that I would ever become interested in edu what, you know, the word education. I've got no formal qualifications. Uh, at one point, I, I was sleeping rough on the streets many, many moons ago. Um, and 
uh, if somebody had asked me or told me you are going to be involved in community education and uh, trying to shape what educational opportunities there are, uh, I would have sort of laughed and so you know you're not the wrong person. Um, so it was it was really a process of accidental discovery, and uh, I'm going to try and tell you about the what it's trying to mean to me in tangible terms because I'm trying to get into education because we live in a world where unfortunately um, a lot of bureaucratic systems will look at you and go who are you what qualifications do you have how much money do you got and I ain't got any of that but I am a human being and like any other human being I'm perfectly capable of doing anything that any other human being can do. And I would argue that for each and every person. Uh, it, it's about situation and finding the means to, to become what, what we're all potentially, uh, what we've all got potential for. Um, so I, I, I see education as human development. And there's a lot of really interesting work on, on that idea of human development. Um, it's often talked about in terms of um, uh, international development, but I think all the le lessons that have le le been learned there should be applied to our own doorstep. Um, uh, I don't see education as a business. I see it as a behavior. That, that is us, it, it is, without it, part of us is missing. When that part of us is missing, we feel damaged. We, we're, we feel stressed and harmed. And there's a lot of evidence that we can look at that shows us. Um, so I, uh, up here, uh, just to, to give you a context, uh, this is a website of the Ragged University Project. And uh, education is not preparation for life, it is life itself. So that's John Dewey uh, who said that. And it took me years and years to understand that. And I'm still learning what, you know, the depths of it. And the more I understand it, the more I enjoy about life, the more I enjoy about learning, because I become, life becomes more interesting. Other people become more interesting. I become more proficient in achieving the things that I need for my well-being and that I can contribute to other people's well-being too. Because I know... I need other people to be happy and healthy too. Think of it like this. Uh, if you're sitting in a room with loads of hungry people and you sit down with a big plate of food, is that going to be tasting better or worse because people are starving around you? For me, food always tastes better when other people are eating too. There's, there's Life is better when it's a shared experience. And as social matters, homo sapiens, we as primates over 10 million years have been built off of that basis where, where social creatures, our primary strength is in that uh, socialness. So I, I I get people who love what they do to share their knowledge and skills in social spaces. And uh, I find those people by virtue of, of the delight they take in sharing what they've spent their life learning about. And I find I've never found somebody who loves what they do uninteresting. I met a guy who, who knows a lot about bricks. And in the abstract, I thought, what could be interesting about that? <laughs> but pretty soon, that, you know, I, I, I 
came to understand, wait a minute, half of England is can be spoken about more than half through the play, where the play is in mind, you know, brought up, how it's baked, different elements, the geography, how how that play came to be, the the cultures of working sort of class people who who brought that that craft together. Well, I just sat back and I went, bloody, I didn't know that. And I, I've never looked at a brick in, in the same way yeah. since. So I, I think this is one of the, the things in my life that I've, I've learned, find out what people are interested in, and that will be interesting. So I, I use uh, social spaces like pubs, cafes, libraries, uh, parks, uh, any, any space where everybody already owns. I don't like sets of rules imposing, de determining what people can and cannot do. Those are other institutional spaces. They're instituting a set of rules on people and uh, it, prevents people from uh, expressing much more interest and much more dynamic things. I've learned a lot more in pubs, uh, in, in coffee shops, and, you know, and in parties, when people are just definitely loving, loving their thing. And going into the, the, the detailed nuances, where in institutional spaces they're told, keep it to 15 minutes. You know, PowerPoint presentation, blah, 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 blah. That's the rules. That's how people's attention span is this. And the, these rote ways of seeing the world, I think, are nonsense. Do, do uh, people write notes in house? Uh, some people. I, I, I carry paper. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yes. But only when it's very important. Reminders, yeah, um, and but it's not a personal choice. But yeah, absolutely, it's a personal choice. Yeah. Um, when it's very important, yeah. I feel all the time. <laughs> well, writing is a really important tool to extend memory. It's not the foundation of learning. Um, it. It can, it's a really useful tool. Uh, I have learned that when I write notes, I can then uh, structure my memories much more effectively and I can go back to conversations I've forgotten. Even if I'm, I'm just putting keywords or drawing mind maps. Um, so yeah, it, it depends. Some people are booky, some people write, some people don't. I, I knew one guy and spent Seven years, I go into his house and we'd, we'd uh, have, a, uh, have tea and smokes and uh, basically talk. And uh, he was really funny. He was like silly Connolly funny. And uh, before I would go into his house, he'd say, leave your books at the door, pal. None of that in here. But at one point, I, mean, I sat and I said, look, oh. You know what you just said there? A guy called Rene Descartes came up with. It's like, I don't care. His thinking was absolutely brilliant. And then one day he said, I'll show you what knowledge is. I'll show you what education is. He took me out and took me for a walk. And he said, see that pointing up there on that building? That's, that's rubbish. That pointing on that building, that really good. And then you know, see the leading around that, that's really hard to do. This is how you do that. And, uh, not at all. <laughs> um, and then one day, it, you know, turned around and he went, would you, would you show me how to read? I was like, you're shitting me. The guy 
didn't like books because nobody had taught him, taken the time. But he was a master craftsman, a master roofer. And it reminds me of a story in, in Manchester. There was a, 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 a bridge was trying to be, well, we needed to be built across a canal. And it was a transsectional bridge. And they were uh, looking for the right person who had the skill set. And they couldn't get the engineer. Um, and everybody kept on saying, well, you, you want such and such, the, the, the mill right. And they eventually got, uh, could you draw up plans to build this bridge? And he said, uh, no. Well, you could read and write. He said, bring me a big block of cheese. I said, a big block of cheese was brought, and he carved it. And he spoke about the structural elements that you need to build a transsectional bridge across that width of canal. And it was through inherent knowledge. He had learned through doing. And so he, he helped design the bridge. Um, and a lot of knowledge is, is in our landscape like that, uh, um, particularly older generations. Uh, in, in the highlands of Scotland, you'll find some really interesting uh, history that, that is not on any piece of paper. It's only an oral tradition. And the life, the, the knowledge, the knowledge and wisdom is stored in the people. And whilst I love books and writing, there's a, a lovely quote from uh, Socrates warning about uh, be warned, you know, warned about the, the power of books. It makes people think that they know stuff. <laughs> I love libraries, university libraries particularly. And I've always seen, I think, that there are places to go and be dead. Because most of the people who've written were libraries are dead. Mm -hmm. And books are a way of carrying the word forward so that the future generation, when you're not going to be alive, and um, archives like that, we were talking about an archive this year yesterday. Um, and I think, you see, I, I yeah, I asked a question about notes, because I just noticed you all started to write notes, and I thought this was quite funny because I had these long conversations with Aaron, so we've had it for a long time, but I've never for once imagined that he'd give a talk and people would sit down and write notes. <laughs> 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 but um, I think it's always in the people, isn't it? It's, it's, always, it's always in the people. Yes. And you get to know dead people. These, these are, are, are yeah, yes, these artifacts of people. You know, it's really interesting. I, I sit and I read this, I imagine sitting with somebody. And I'm with this person, I, you, can, you can hear the guy talk. And, uh, I found some of the... Uh, the recordings of Ivan Illich being interviewed. He was a, an intensely interesting guy um, who really challenged the norms of, of how our world is structured. Um, and so, and so when I, I'm reading a book, my imagination takes me to thinking, so you can see there, there are five interviews throughout this page, uh, which, which is really worthwhile. I'm going to read, read a, a, an excerpt from this later to give you a flavor of what, what he was arguing, which is uh, deinstitutionalization. When, when, we, when we talk about learning and education, there's this knee-jerk reaction to go, well, we learn in schools and colleges and universities. And that's, whilst that's a part, uh, you know, there's a part truth. It's a tip of the iceberg. The majority of the, the learning that goes on in our worlds, in our lives, happens outside of set institutional spaces. And 
without sets of rules and without parameters. A lot of it happens through play. And so I like the, the metaphor uh, of mycelium. So we see mushrooms above the ground. Those are just the fruiting bodies. Underneath, there are these huge networks of connect, interconnected um, root systems. What we were using are they rhizomatic? Have you said an example of a rhizome? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. That's what I was thinking of, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 It's, you know, uh, one person argues that the biggest living organism in the world is a fungus, uh, you know, that lives under the ground. It's not physical. Once, you know, a seasonal pop up uh, the, the fruit and bodies so it can propagate somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so we go into universities and colleges and we, we've got these structured ways of going through certain things to, to acquire more knowledge, to acquire experience. But all of the things that are happening in the university are also happening outside so I, I'm going to try and bring to life how I see that in practical ways. So there's a guy called Umberto Eco who uh, wrote Kinship Relations as the Primary Nucleus of Institutionalized Social Relations. He wrote this in his theory of semiotics. Um, and it's one of the four elementary phenomena which we find in all advanced cultures. Um, I think all learning stems from that. Uh, what it means is uh, the institutions of our world are rooted in the relationships we have. So if we, uh, we look at the, the child is born to uh, adults, and everything that goes on between those beings, all those behaviours are the basis for what we've, we've found sacred. And this is really important, nurturing, communicating what I know so that the youngster gets, you know, understands and can be independent from them. And uh, we can think about that in terms of health and uh, Safety as well. So if we look at the police force, parents look after the safety of, of the kids. And uh, when they get ill, they look after the health. So they're doctors and police and social workers. Uh, the most complex job in the world is raising a, a little human being. And just spending an afternoon with my goddaughters. <laughs> I mean, I. I have to learn to remember that I, I can learn so much from them. Mm -hmm. like asking questions that topple your, your logic that, you know, that I, I've been carrying around. Uh, my, my niece asked me, why, why, do, why, why, can't, why do dogs have to wipe their gum? <laughs> That's a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Right, okay, I'm going to have to think about that again. Um, right, yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the really profound existential things, uh, emotional things that they point out, adults are really rubbish at emotions sometimes. You know, and kids are really good at They can look at you and they can read you, and they can go, oh, you're feeling that. Oh, wait a minute. Don't be meant to see what I'm feeling. You know, we're, we can be guarded. Um, but they can also be intensely intellectual because they're, they're not, their head's not filled with what they've been told the world should look like. They're looking at something, and they're, they're, they're just saying it. The emperor's got no clothes on. No, 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 I'm pretty sure I was told that Emperor's got 
like finery for really clever people can see, but I just can't see it because I'm not of that class. <laughs> and I've always had this problem with being told that any, you know, only there are special people and there aren't special people. I think it's nonsense. I think everybody's got the capacities to do and to understand and to realize anything. And informal education is uh, education in the wild. It's a free freedom that we've got to develop, to self-realize and to support everybody to, to become who they are, whatever that may be. So we, we look at the established and imposing buildings of our institutions, and it's not a lot hard to, uh, it's hard not to imagine them as superhuman. Something more than us, rather than something of us. But I would argue this is just a, a, a manifestation of what we do uh, without thinking. We can make ourselves conscious of that. Uh, through plotting out and communicating with somebody else. Universities, schools and colleges, the hospitals, the government agencies, the police force, social work department and so on are all built manifestations of our intrinsic relationships with each other and the world. All that goes on in a university or any given institution has its origins and animating principle in what we find taking place between people. Formal education is the reified manifestation of a collection of apparatus which facilitates us doing one of the most fundamental behaviors, the behavior of education. The for formal education is a ritualized and codified construction of what we do naturally. Not only us, but many species, ranging from ants to primates. The formal is a part, a small part of a massive interconnected whole. Formal education is the tip of an iceberg where the main body lies submerged. Universities, schools and colleges are like the fruiting bodies of mushrooms, appearing visibly above the ground, but underneath and obscured from sight, the extensive mycelium a web of interconnections which are, relation, which are our relationships and the world. Thornton and Raihani, who study teaching and learning throughout the animal world, describe teaching as a form of behavior that functions to promote learning in others. Carroll and Hauser clarify three criteria for identifying the occurrence of teaching. An individual A modifies its behavior only in the presence of a naive observer B. A incurs some cost or derives no immediate benefit. As a result of A's behavior, B requires knowledge or skills, uh, acquires knowledge or skills more rapidly or efficiently than it would otherwise. So that, I'm looking for a hard definition. Well, what is teaching? What are we doing? What are not just we doing? Lots of species. Is there a similar definition as possible? No. Uh, but they, they do uh, go on to say, um, uh, so they, they go on to say, adherence to conventional narrow definitions of teaching generally derived from human infant interactions has caused many related but simpler work phenomena in species to go unstudied, unrecorded, and severe, severely limits further exploration of this topic. And, and I think it's an example of why so much attention is directed inward towards university, to the formalized spaces to understand learning. And we imagine that that's where quality is stored. People come in and have their brains filled with knowledge and then go out and become productive members of society. 
whereas it's much, much, much different. I think these are these are rooms. These are seats, tables. They're, they're computers. Uh, is there anything? Does anybody see anything in here or in the university that you don't see out in the wider world? Assignments. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, bureaucracy. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, what happens between a mother and a newborn baby? When, when, when there's that relationship, it's almost, it's just, it's, it's just pure sort of love, really. And, and nothing, you know, not just for sort of the baby. Oh, you know, you want to, I can't do it, but sometimes I want to fight for my <laughs> um, You know what I mean? It's clear. And the baby will react with a smile and will, you know, wiggle around it. And, and there's an absolute sort of um, symbiotic relationship that will happen. Um, it's is that teaching? Yes, there's teaching that goes on there. Who's teaching who? I think it's probably a dialogue. Mm. I think there's, there's a call and response. And I, I, I understand learning and teaching as always being together, you know. Um, and um, it's, it's a, a, a process, and it's the moving back and forth, the, that process of exercising your perception from one position to another, and then to another, and then to another. Understanding multiple um, positions that we get more detailed understandings, more and more perspectives around it. It's, we can, we can look at the same thing from multiple angles. So you often find in conversations people use a different set of words, and and all oh right, well I don't get you. Can you tell me more? And somebody will use another set of words. And in this way, poetry and mathematics converge. They're, they're describing the world, our, our experience in the world. These are just a series of means of uh, collaborating. But that's important, isn't it? Because so often you have a classroom, you have a teacher, you have a set of students to sit down with high notes, and the teacher gives them some sort of gospel stuff. And everyone writes it down. And, and this is the kind of ritual that we play. Mm. It's just as if this is the description, this is the truth. This is, um, but what you just said is actually, no, it's not. It's a description. And, and you've got plenty already inside you, which actually, if we're going to take the word literally as education, we're going to try and lead out of you. But um, uh, there are many other descriptions that are possible. So we don't do that because the institution focuses on the single thing that's given by the teacher, that's put on the exam paper, and all the rest of it. There's somebody called Marion Diamond who talks about uh, enriched environments. And the more enriched an environment, the more development goes on in the brain. The more connections. So our, our nerves, nerves are formed from stimulus. Like light muscles, we go to the gym, we lift up uh, weights or whatever. And our body goes, oh bloody hell, I'm not used to this. I'm not in the apparatus. I look at the <laughs> 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 I try to sleep. Uh, I look at it. Uh, but there's a signal and process that goes on that was. We need more muscle. If we're going to be lifting these weights, more muscle cells need to be built. So there's a biofeedback, and that is the same about the brain. So we've got these neurons that grow. And when we say listen to music, new neurons will be formed. And the more music we listen to, more any any information will cause our brain to go, well, we need a new pattern. We need, to, we need new neurons connecting with this. And the old ones that are used retract. 
So there's a reinforcement process that goes on. And Marion Dyne uh, did a lot of research and showed in an enriched environment, you get more complex, more healthy brains. Charles Darwin studied this, and he looked at domestic rabbits, the brains of domestic rabbits compared to wild rabbits, and found that wild rabbits had much more developed complex brains, and suggested that it's to do with the enriched environment. Because a rabbit in a cage, or a chicken in a cage, would be sitting there going, what can I do? Well, what can I do? I know, well, I can eat and chip. <laughs> I can pet my own feathers out. You know? um, and the, the domestication process doesn't stimulate the brain to develop. Whereas a rabbit running around this way, <laughs> there's a hill over there, there's a hill over there, there's a hawk up there. Well, I've got to keep myself fit, but I've got to eat the things that I want to eat. And, uh, oh, there's a girl rabbit. Hey, there's a boy rabbit. Whatever. All the decision making is the choices, the, the, the multiplicity of choices that the rabbit is given that causes all these connections going on. Can't make the connection with that. So, informal education, as you mentioned, is education in the wild. Yes. So, therefore, using the, the kind of Darwinian analogy, the sort of kind of domesticated form of education in formal educational contexts breeds sort of um, kind of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind Conventional of, thinking. Okay, I love that. <laughs> well, Fred, yeah, kind of conventional level of thinking. Whereas taken out of the sort of familiar pattern of the formal education, informal education in the wild would therefore, you know, following that logic, generate some more kind of dynamic thinkers. Or... I, I think we, we need both. We need both. We, we need an enriched environment. We need lots of options and possibilities. And everybody needs those possibilities. So the more, the better. And it's not about going one or another. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there are many ways to do it. And if you can do things many ways, yes. yeah. you then have options to operate in different contexts. And you might come up with a way that other people have. Yeah. Yeah. So, can I ask you a question? How many of you have spent a year not coming to school. One, two, okay. So what did you do when you went to school? I worked. You worked? At the nursery. Okay. And as a teacher assistant. Yeah. Okay. And what's the difference between not being in school and being in school? Because this is school, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think it's more like you're learning from David than like behind the Learning through assignments, which I think you can learn more from doing. Well, I do, anyway. Yeah, we all do. Being a nursery, um, yeah. school, I can still carry on learning in a way, yeah. but like you learn from the kids and the kids' perspective. Like, I like to say, learning from the kids' perspective, and you're learning how they mm. think and how they see the world. That was find that quite interesting, mm. how they like perceive things. Which obviously is different to me, you know, they've done school and education and everything. So I quite enjoyed it. But for the ones who haven't seen anything apart from school since you were, what, four, five? Just think about it. As you've been in this situation since you were four or five. And actually, um, over the last three years, um, someone managed to convince you that. You actually need to pay for that yourself. That's amazing. I wouldn't call I, I, I had to, to be a primary school teacher. I needed to have a degree. And I, didn't, I just didn't manage to go to school. That's the issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Does, has anybody learned anything by using YouTube or QBOs? Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a, one of the most brilliant places to go, how do I do this? Uh, I've got a mate who are musicians who have just gone, oh, I've learned loads of stuff doing this. Uh, sorting out computers, and I've started using it uh, as, as a real free range community of uh, learning. So, there are interesting ways that we can use elements in our world to build competencies, to build the abilities to be independently able to do something. Picking up on what, what you said. You needed the certificate. This is one of my bugbears. Uh, it really, I, I think it is, it's a, a moral and ethical issue that uh, people are not given the opportunity to, to demonstrate what they know independently of being. It's, it's complex though, isn't it? Because you need a passport to travel. And very often you need a passport to go and work in the field. Well, you might do, then you might find another way of doing it. Though you need another way of doing it. Uh, but they're harder. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're better, but they're harder. Um, but when you say that if you do a degree, you keep your options open as well, in terms of like professions and stuff, like you can go join a class scheme and stuff like that, and for that you need to have a qualification, there's no other way of getting one for but then you're not limited by the degree you do. Most of them are just like an yeah. average trainer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You see, the other, the other side of this is actually what are you being trained to do? You're being trained to be part of the system which will keep kids in formal education in school from the age of four until what, 21, 22, maybe longer. That's interesting. What's that all about? <laughs> Going back to yeah, 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 Special Education Research Association mm -hmm. and Craig Gaston Storm and Terry Pye. I don't have to follow these guys, so mm -hmm. it's a bit hard going. But you mentioned the phrase there, which I thought was nice. Something we're trying to do in this model, model I think. I'm not sure. As we know, we don't know who we're doing. What we're doing. But you talked about rewilding of education. And I really like that phrase and seeing a little bit more of what you're thinking. And in a way, you know, what we're trying to do in this module collectively and and enjoying it. Could you say a little bit about how you might rewind higher education or, or or formal education? I think some of you guys talked about the informal and the formal, how we might uh, dig where we stand and create a space. So there was a phrase you used, I don't know if you yeah. used it today. Yes. Yes, I would. Not formal. I think it's a really important. Thing. Uh, so, does it? Has anybody not heard about rewilding? Say that more. Right. Okay. So, rewilding is an idea that's come about because our physical environment is becoming pretty devastated. We lost fifty percent of our species in the, the uh, British Isles, like extinct. No, like we're losing um, the habitat, the, the physical habitat that we have evolved with for 10 million years. And that matters to us, physically and mentally. Um, so we're, the, there are lots of, obviously we're, we're thinking about climate change, the loss of environment, there are different ideas of how we approach that. Uh, there's, there's lines of thinking on conservation, but there, there's this, out, out of this came an idea that rewilding, giving space back to nature, if you let nature be, it will re-establish itself. 
So rather like children, if you let children be, they actually develop pretty, pretty well. So let children play, facility where you can. Um, and it's give, giving the space to for um, nature to do what it does rather than the very sort of mystery and colonial perspective of I know what's right for you because in, in natural terms, in natural environments, there's uh, a, a classic example is uh, of the cane toads in, in, uh, in Australia. So the, the Australia is like, oh, right, okay, we don't, uh, I think they, they didn't like a fly or something. So frogs eat flies, we'll get these toads from another place because they obviously don't eat the flies and bring them over. They multiplied and they became a, a blight, uh, a plague. And also the flies just adapt it. They just, rather than hovering close to the ground, they, they started hovering <laughs> further away from the ground. So that that way of imposing on nature what's not in So in native species, rhododendrons like, just destroy natural habitats because nothing can grow under them. Equal. Rhododendrons poison the ground as well. They steal all the light, they steal the nutrients from the soil, etc., etc. So rewilding would be more uh, trees for life is a really good project. And what you see is just when you don't have humans clambering over, decide imposing what we think is best all the time. Nature does really inspiring things. In succession, birch comes out. So in terms of intellectual abilities uh, and, and our, our, our mental development, uh, um, I think one of the invasive species is managerialism and bureaucracy. But it outcomes and bloody measures. <laughs> we're the species, huh? Yeah, we're, we're, we have. Oh yeah, we're, we're, we're doing it to ourselves. It, it's, it's, we've, we've created these rituals that we've been taught make us more real. What we're doing, real. It's, it's a lot of it stems from uh, the, the rise uh, of, um, I would argue, the, the Chicago School of Economics. Um, and it's moving things from into an abstract world where a decision maker who's, who's way, you know, nothing to do with where things are happening, goes, okay, I've looked at the numbers and I've decided because you're a grade one and you're a grade three, I'm going to make these global decisions for everybody. So uh, why have we done that? Why 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 did we why were the numbers so attractive in the first place? It's uh, the obsession for productivity <laughs> and growth. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll get some Illich out. Right. <laughs> no, don't read this book. Really, really, you don't know this book. You should read this book. If you read nothing else, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere, the hidden curriculum for schooling initiates the citizen to the myth that bureaucracies guided by scientific knowledge are efficient and benevolent. Everywhere, the same curriculum instills in the pupil the myth that increased production will provide a better life. And everywhere, it develops the habit of self-defeating consumption of services and alienating production. The, tolerate, the tolerance for institutional dependence and the recognition of institutional rankings. The hidden curriculum of school does all this 
in spite of contrary efforts undertaken by teachers and no matter what ideology prevails. Um, so so th there's a, a, lot, a lot of this can be traced back to Stanley Jevons um, in, in Manchester. And he, he developed one of the first mathematical versions of economics. Prior to that, uh, political economy was a sociolog sociological science. It was the study of uh, man in the everyday business of life. Right? It was about relationships, functional relationships, not numbers on spreadsheets. So think about maybe a factory floor, Lord, you know, Bessie and Jill and Tom and Ben are all working away, maybe stuck in teddy bears. And somebody's walk, you know, the, the gaffer is walking through. Hey, Jesse, how's it going? Uh, how's the kids? Fine, yeah, yeah. Well, the one's got the chicken box. Ah, oh, good, good, good. Do you need anything? No, no, no. I'm fine, you know, just give me some. Um, Ben's going, oh, well, I want to go off for a weekend. I'm, I'm really lacking. It's, oh, yeah, great. Uh, and so uh, there's a relationship. But in the modern corporation, Nike and the stock market, just everything becomes a spreadsheet. And I sit in Wall Street and I go, for every share I own, the productivity of each pence is 0, 0 0.1 cent profit. How can I make more profit? Can, can, can we cut any costs? Can we cut any human beings from the process? So we're getting rid of humans. Why have we done that? Um, it's a stupid thing to do, isn't it? It's, it's, I, I, I think it's a bit of a cult of finance. Cults like the And we just want more. I think it's, no one wants more. more, and more. That's the culture we live in. Just everyone wants to have everything, which is why you work for a pay rise, you can fat buy more things, more expensive things. So it's the finance, the culture you live in that's dictated that thought process to that point. Everyone wants more, so we work out there. Then we try and cut costs wherever we can, so we can have more. Yeah. But wouldn't we all be dead by the time? Wouldn't we have, you know, we'd have never finished it all off, wouldn't we? Well, it's self preservation as well, isn't it? Um, so, how does that work? So, like, the CEO of Nike isn't stupid, like, he knows he needs work. If he can cut the cost of a human by getting a machine, no bother with him, and the human's got to go and find another job, which is created out of uh, like a necessity to work. People need work, he's dull, back up. Maybe I did ask a lot in the factory, or I worked in Nike, so I would work in this factory. Then eventually Adidas would employ the same machines and then get rid of it, and it would just be the end of the cycle. But he still tries, the worker still tries to work and sustain stuff. So. Yes. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. When they create an avenue for the more skilled workers to be able to like run the machine, like if they could run the machine, they like they want a human job. When they create an avenue for a more skilled worker to be able to run that machine, but you don't need more workers on just ten machines. Whereas if you can do it one person, so you, you are quoting people, but you are only one person to run them. Yeah, this is this is um, I've known to wrote this book, which is called Reforming Society. Which is worth writing down actually because it's a fantastic book. But um, he wrote another book after it called Tools for Conviviality. And his argument was that technology is exactly what you just described actually. Technology effectively um, takes over. And um, what happens is that um, you only need one person to operate a machine that can now do a tremendous amount of work. And the interest saying what we need is a society where we use tools on a human scale, where people are actually encouraged to work together and talk with each other and be together. And um, and his criticism of education was that it was becoming more like a kind of um, a JCB, 
You know, it just became a sausage factory where everyone's passed through and you, you, you sit in classrooms and take notes and get a degree. Whereas actually, it should be something a place of conversation, a place where you just talk to each other and look after each other. Um, and uh, these, these are actually, nobody's really got the answer to any of this stuff. But with perhaps there are some people who have asked better questions. Questions. Something to reflect. Our, our global welfare, well-being, is is in, in a dire state. The number of stress-induced illnesses, the mental illnesses, physical illnesses that are directly related to coming from stress, mm. lifespans. Like quality of life going down, and uh, Gene Ziegler, he was the UN Red Special Rapporteur on the Right for Food. Uh, this is a book called Betting on Famine. So, due to this spreadsheet stuff, the people you know, uh, um, at Davos, the home for the morally correct. Um, these uh, these people are involved in a complex that is causing death and famine on a global scale. And then this is the UN saying it. So uh, Jean uh, estimated that uh, 7 billion people on the planet, 1 in 7 is permanent mal malnutrition, malnourished. But there's there's food to feed 12 billion. And people who live in a bubble with just these abstract numbers rather than in community, they're all right, well, small business, people are in relationships can understand the plight of people. People sitting in the city of London or on Wall Street, I don't know, so I can't care. You know, people in the Adidas factory, you know, all right, three strikes a year out, I don't know what, what employment policies. Everything's moving to short-term contract, but it's just a Tetris game. <laughs> and I'm really drifting, drifting from the subject of informal education, but I got very interested in, in journalistic aspects, understanding the world, understanding, wait a minute, is, is this the paradise and utopia that I thought it was? Well, I've been told it was. I'm so lucky. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in Scotland, I'm told education is free. For who? Yes. It was a rhetoric. Um, I, I want to have the skills to be able to uh, make the reality checks and go, what do I think about this? Is, is what I'm thinking bollocks? Uh, is there truth in this? Um, is our food chain toxic? Is it giving us diabetes? Oh, I, I decided, yeah, I can, I can become informed. I can make my own decisions because I can read medicine. And anybody can. It's just a set of words. And I can look up the meaning of the word or work out the rationale. It really helps to be with other people who I can talk this through. I can go, does this make sense to you? Or maybe over a coffee. And you can go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you maybe not understood this about what you're looking at. And medicine is no different to fixing a, a bite. It's just a set of different language. And uh, I think rewilding our world, our education is, is Take, making a personal covenant with learning, mm. going, what, what I know and what I can do is a wealth which belongs to me, which belongs to you. 
you know. And no, once you've got that, nobody can take it from you. Um, and allowing that, you know, whatever you need, allowing yourself the benefit of the doubt to to pursue things, allowing other people. So in people who are in education uh, are overwhelmingly interested in other people achieving what they want to achieve. This, and it, they, they do it despite the, the administrative systems. So I, I think we should, should define our world. We should self-realize our world. We should understand the maybe why things have come about, but what usefulness is. Not, not be afraid to be critical. Um, and not be afraid to self-criticize. There's things I've wanted to be true, or turned, turned out not to be true, but I'm a better person for it. I, you know, when I, I sort of gone, oh, right, the world's, you know, this aspect of the world is just nuts. It's not malicious, maybe. Um, and, and learning um, has been a route to me having a wealth and being able to do things like uh, talk to anybody in any university, in any job, and go, I want to know what you know. What do you think is time for you? Learning. Um, if, you, if you see yourself as an organist, uh -huh. Existing in this world that we've got now, and a new lot of organisms, you've got to survive in a, in a world that's actually quite hostile. Um, and, 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 you know, and you know this. Um, what has what has the learning done? It's, it's given me freedom. Yeah. Um, I I can do things without money. I'm not, I'm not dependent on other people or on an institution rubber stamping me. So, all right, so um, is it because it's giving you flexibility? It's right. flexibility to adapt, to um, connect with other people, to be involved in culture, um, to, and, and, uh, that that is our lifeblood. You take take that away from us as social mammals. You take a primate out of a social group, and it will slowly die. It's it's uh, solitary confinement is a form of torture, and that torture manifests first psychologically, and then in things like. Um, Heart disease, atherosclerosis, um, lots, lots of different conditions, and so I, coming from the background I did, I didn't have any options. Uh, I I couldn't. I wanted to learn stuff, and the universities went. Uh, well, we can't get the, the the money for you, so our teacher. We're not going to let our teachers talk to you. But I soon realised. I can find people who love what they do. Greg, Andy, Mark, other people, you know, just go, can I buy a coffee? What, what are you doing? What books do you think you know, are worthwhile reading? I, I, want to, I want to be involved in this conversation. I would have, I would have given up on life because that is life. Education is not a preparation for it. It's life itself. Practical things have come from it. You know, I can build websites now. Um, I've got confidence. I'm not terrified of people anymore. And confidence, I remember as a, one of you said that to me earlier. It was you, wasn't it? You said you have the confidence. Yeah, in the stores, yeah. 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 Um, so, where is it? 
I think they're not the continents will be not faster than it can be built up. So it was like the next over the course of three years, it's slowly built up to where I'm at now. But you know, as it's me from first year, are you confident to talk about the interactive having knowledge? I wouldn't run away probably. So what is when you're confident is as if you you know what to do in the situation. So you've got you've got options. It's a bit like Alex now, it's got more options as he is able to Thinking, that's a good that. But then you first believe. Yeah, it's like when you think of someone else's future, which is based on fact, and the same. What is what you think is the right thing to do? So I think I can help it and go for it. Can I just ask Alex a couple of questions just before we move to towards you know, a coffee break? Yeah, yeah. A couple of questions there. So, what has inspired you to learn? And then linking into that, if indeed if there is a connection, I suspect there might be. So, what has inspired you to learn, and how did the Record University come about? What inspired me to learn was people. I guess. Uh, everything I know. I can trace back and link to somebody. It's a relationship. And uh, pleasure. I have a pleasure. It, it gives me great pleasure to, to look at something and understand it. Whether it's, uh, you know, the pointing of a building. Wait, another one. Right, that's well me. So that's going to pop down. <laughs> uh, or, or whether it's uh, be able to, you know, make uh, um, profiteroles. <laughs> Shoe pastry. Oh, <laughs> genius. Um, or, or whether it's be able to put together a, a, a thesis on on treating a medical condition. Um, and it's people who took time to see in me value as a human being when I had not known that. And I was surprised because some you know, people said, of course you can you know, understand it. So I spent a lot of time with a retired pharmacist drinking. Like, uh, and we worked out a, a treatment for alcohol. And there you go. And that's now being, you know, put together as a field trial in Stern. Um so, so, you know, here's, here's a, an example of the work that I've done. Um, one of my first loves taught me Calligraphy and how to write. There's a, a book of artwork and poetry with the calligraphy style and writing. Uh, so it's people and it's being. It's an, uh, you know, these are slightly ethereal phrase, existential wealth. Mm -hmm. Without it, uh, it's a uh, I lived in a poverty. With Ragged Uni, uh, it started, I, I was helping out, uh, sorry, out an office. A friend, Jess, told me or asked me, would you help sort out an office in a nice organization in Hackney Marshes? Um, they just need a hand. So I went down, voluntary, sorted out an office, been back with receipts and shit like that. And they said, oh, thanks very much. That's really helpful. How would you help bring people together and improve people's lives? And I had no idea. And so I returned to Edinburgh. I talked to two friends who were retired educators. Eileen Norton and Leroy Wilshire. Uh, and I said, how would you do this? And they said, well, you remind us of Ivan Illich and Ragged Scoops. And I said, what are they? 
and they taught me. So Eileen used to talk to you. His, uh, she taught systems thinking and economics. Uh, and uh, Roy taught uh, history. And they just told me about this history. So before 1870, um, in the UK, free education uh, was done by philanthropists and entrepreneurs like John Pallance. Well, that's a distorted picture of this guy, he was a crippled cobbler in Portsmouth. Uh, and he brought kids in, uh, on the streets into his shop and he taught them how they read, how to make them to cobble, uh, gave them quite foods, kids. And uh, Charles Dickens wrote about the, what this guy was doing. And across the UK, Different communities, they're going, how do we, we deal with the collective poverty? And a guy called Thomas Guthrie heard about this and went, This is what we need to do. So he was, he was uh, at the Greyfriars Church and he asked the church for money to do free education. And uh, they said, It's a bit idealistic. <laughs> so he did a whip around in the community and actually slipped from the church and he started the first what what they call the ragged schools uh, and uh, people like the Earl of Shaftesbury got involved gave the first sixpence to Dr Bernardo on the rooftops of London and said everybody is to be nurtured in this way and by the time 1870 came on, the Forced Their Education Act, the government went, this is good for everybody. So I was talking to friends down in London. Uh, I re returned and I said, this is what we should do. We should take this tradition and we should carry it on. But think about how we can create a model of education that can function beyond funding in the most impoverished places because funding doesn't get there. The poorest people can oh, here's a grant for 30 grand. It's a nonsense. It's a bureaucratic idiocy. So we, I, I walked from the A10, down the A10, I went every pub, cafe and library, and I said, can I have your sleeves? for free and get people in to share their knowledge. You know, just do a couple of talks, we'll enjoy your ale or your, your coffee. And that's it. It's the tradition of ragged schools. Of 32 asked, 30 said yes. About six of them jumped across the campus and said, yes, we need this. I'm so up for it. So it's just surprising. <laughs> um, and so got, got you know, with uh, Jess and Will and Graham, uh, the first event, we, we just thought, would people enjoy it? A couple of talks in a pub and build off of that experience. And when, when people share their knowledge, find ways to support them. So anybody who does a talk, Anybody who contributes to the community, I, I will do anything for. And I realise that people like it. Uh, it continued. It, I realised my life improved in multiple ways, which is why I'm chewing my ears off. Um, and eight years later, uh, I realised this is what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm now interested in um, trying to expand uh, the, the definitions of education beyond formal to, to how do we get people valued for the knowledge that they do have. 
So I, I hope that gives you a sort of a potted view. Um, uh, I know I've been waffling on. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> if I can make a suggestion. Yeah. So if we if we have a, a coffee break, a toilet slash coffee break, uh, and then so I invite you guys to think of your various comments, questions. So then you can have uh, Alex for a kind of period of time where you can kind of pick a few ideas around that questions. And then that will move over onto your provocations, your things that you concoct. Okay, so we kind of, it's nearly all past. So if we're back in here for quarter two, so I'll pick the next, and then we'll quickly continue. Yeah. Who's that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get all the